Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth. With your host, Angelo Ponzi. Hi, this is Angelo Ponzi, your host here at the Business Growth Cafe, and thank you for joining us. Uh, today at the cafe, I have Patrick Erlinson, founder and creative director of See It, End It Film and Arts Festival, and Sonia Bailey, YWCA of the Harbor Area Executive Director, to discuss the challenges of bringing awareness, interest, and in the community to engage in the topic of human trafficking in Southern California and around the world. Sonia and Patrick, welcome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Angela. Yeah, um, why don't we start off, Sonia, I'll go to you. Why don't you talk a little bit about you and uh, why, I want to say YMCA, sorry about that, YWCA and your involvement in the film festival, and then we'll go to Patrick. Yes, they're two separate entities, YM and YW. Um, YWCA, we're the ones in San Pedro, actually. You do have one in Orange County that's really fabulous, but we traveled down here to talk to you today from San Pedro. Uh, our YWCA has been around since 1918, actually built by Julia Morgan, the first woman architect who also built Hearst Castle. And it was her birthday yesterday, by the way. And uh, she built the YWCAs in the area, 31 in total. And we're the only one remaining with that same purpose still. Uh, all the others have been repurposed or something else. Oh, fantastic. But uh, she did all that before women were given the right to vote in America. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> so we still have uh, community programs. We've done that for 100 years, mammograms, uh, child care, and community services. And it's a beautiful old home. Okay, fantastic. Patrick? Um, yeah, I grew up in San Pedro area and I've been working in the prevention of human trafficking for about eight years <clears throat> and really wanted to kind of partner it through the years I've been working with the YWCA um, in their racial justice breakfast as kind of the moderator for discussions on human trafficking um, and when I got the idea of having a film festival I wanted to bring it local and and partner with the YWCA so it was just kind of a very natural kind of relationship that we that we created as the nonprofit partner to this vision of, of educating as many people as possible through the arts um, and raising awareness for the purpose of prevention of human trafficking. Okay. Now, this is the, your second year. Second year. Up. That's right. Okay. So, um, I want to talk about the, the topic, if you will, or the, the challenges or the issues of, of human trafficking here in Southern California. But let me step back a little bit. What What drove you? What sparked you to really take on this festival was there an incident or a situation or a story that moved you that you really you really that i've got to get involved well it's first is getting involved in human trafficking and then is getting involved in in prevention and that led to the festival so okay. i would say i worked for for a time when um, the united nations refugee agency opened an office opened an office here in los angeles and it was working with the the refugee agency that we were getting field reports from from Africa of children escaping southern Sudan, crossing Egypt to get to Israel where they would be safe and could get jobs. And these were like parents who were sending their kids away because either the, either a parent had died, a parents were dead, um, or they were trying to get their kids to safety. So you had groups of children and and some, you know, accompanying adults, but they were crossing Egypt, you know, to to, to leave a place where there was a war that was destroying their communities mm -hmm. and, and villages. Um, and then these Bedouins would come in and, and, and take them in. So there, were, there was a group of Bedouins that would invite them in, feed them, befriend them, and then call for a doctor from Cairo who would then come down, drug them and cut out their organs and bury them in the desert. And it was, it was that that just grabbed hold of my heart. It was mm -hmm. just that, that betrayal of children that, that are just trying to escape something horrible and put their trust in some adults who act like they care about them and then destroy them. And, uh, and that just kind of gripped me. And then I started researching everything I could find about human trafficking, which led me to how prevalent it is here in Southern California. Um, and, so we, and, and looking at, at labor trafficking, you look at people who are working for generations to pay off a debt because they, they can't read. So they're, they're deceived into working. You, know, you have grandchildren that are being employed and, and worked um, to death in many cases 
you know, in this fraudulent kind of system of labor trafficking. Uh, but then the sex trafficking, because we have such a, a hyper-sexualized culture, we have tremendous amounts of money of discretionary income in the United States, that this really becomes a hub for a sex trafficking. And then that creates a tremendous demand. So we have, we have girls growing up in the Central Valley. We, we have people growing up in extremely vulnerable situations in America. Um, we, we create vulnerability through what's happened to the family. And we have a, a very large population of young people for predators to prey on. And, and that's kind of what's happened. I mean, the, the numbers are 100 to 300,000 American young people are getting trafficked uh, annually. Um, and that's average age of 12 to 14. And I'm assuming these are both U.S. citizens and immigrants. And the hundred to three hundred thousand is American citizens. American and the citizens. figure that the figure that we have for being people being brought into the United States to be trafficked is about seventeen thousand. Wow. You, you, we talked about labor trafficking, right? This, this is kind of all an, an umbrella for human trafficking, but labor trafficking. They're talking about people working and the indebtedness to, to pay off this. Right. Is this generational? I mean, if if someone is brought in for for labor and you know they have a kid and they get older and they're not working, they tell the kid the kid has to do the same. I mean, is this a generational thing? The generational labor trafficking is not as prevalent in the United States, although it does happen, um, where where then children are then being put to work and in horrible cases or where you're having the the mother or the parent doing doing labor being labor trafficked and then having the child be brought into the sex industry. So the child then being taken and, and, and sold for sex. Um, th those are the kind of the worst cases. Uh, but I think in, in other countries, you have much more of the, the generational um, servitude and, and indentured servitude that that we don't have as much of here. Mm -hmm. Now, it, you know, I, when, and, and I'll, I'll put myself in this situation when I think of human trafficking, I mean, I certainly the last thing I start to think about is Southern California. Mm -hmm. but. But in our conversation a little earlier, and I think things I've read on your site, I mean, it's fairly prevalent here. It, it is massively prevalent. I mean, we, we have there's a lot of reasons for that. We have a very transient kind of um, culture with I mean, in community with the ports, so we have a lot of people coming and going. So there's there's foreigners coming in. You do have people coming in for sports events. You have people coming in and going out of the state, which which lends itself to trafficking. We also have a lot of of you know, undocumented people coming across the border into Southern California. And those people are easy prey because they're afraid of being turned into to authorities. And they're very, a lot of those people are very easy to deceive. So then you can manipulate them um, into a very vulnerable situation of trafficking. Um, we have discretionary income. Um, so you have people that are successful here that have money to spend. And, and that lends itself to misusing that, that money and misusing the, the freedoms that we have. So I think I think there's a lot of reasons. Although it's not, it's definitely not limited to to Southern California. And the internet has changed everything. Sure. Um, yeah. As far as human trafficking, so you have Midwest, you have small towns in the Midwest that have a human trafficking problem. Um, it's just it's not it's not restricted to big cities. It's not restricted to just certain states. It's across the board. Well, you know, when something happens and it gets news coverage, right? The young girls on the internet with a with a predator. You know, we hear about one or two incidences, but this sounds obviously through the internet. I mean, it's a it's a massive pool, if you will, of, yeah. of solicitation. Well, we've we've never had that before. We have pe pe people are coming and going inside of your house all day, every day. I mean, we think we lock the door, and you think you, you don't have strangers coming in through the internet. You have strangers coming in night and day. Mm -hmm. Anybody who anybody who clicks on a certain app is inviting a stranger into your home, and so the recruiting is now shifted. You know, we have these we've kind of these these images of the pimp on the street corner, kind of, you know, hustling girls, and that still exists. But you have so much recruiting now going on online. Um, it's it's just easy access, and and I don't know of any twelve or thirteen year old that doesn't have a gripe against their parents. And and if you if you're a, you know a thirty forty fifty year old guy pretending to be whatever, listening to a child complain. That that child feels like this is the person I can trust. This is the person I can share anything with. This person really cares about me, and that's where you end up with this this nightmare of children trusting a complete and total stranger that they've never actually even sat down in the same room with more than their own parents. Yeah, crazy, crazy. Yeah. Sonia, so let's talk about your end and how you got involved in and what's your participation in all of this. Well, our main 
our main angle is really prevention so that no 12 year old 10 year old 14 year old 18 year old should ever have to suffer the horrors of human trafficking so that we want to be able to bring awareness to the parents to the grandparents to the school teachers to the person on the street to protect our young people so they don't even have to be approached it's scary to the fact that our communities especially where we are it's not a matter of if you're going to get approached it's really when hmm. and through the uh wymca why why wca just say the y -dub. i'm gonna get it huh <laughs> just say the y dub the y dub through the y dub <laughs> I, I grew up we had a y ymca in my when you say the y, you think of the ym <laughs> yeah yeah um so this sounds like a lot of education to parents and, and is that yes. really facilitated at, 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 yes. at the ym i mean we YW. Y -dub, the y -dub, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get it right. I'm going to get it right, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, actually, we see it at the parents' end. We see it at the children's end. We have teenage kids that come to us, and they don't need the peripheral problems of being trafficked and what to watch out for. They need to be aware. And these kids, they deserve the life to go to school and go to college and have the dreams that everyone else does without having to watch over their shoulder all the time and it's really also an issue that parents need to be aware of and just say oh it's not going to happen to my child and you know we just want to do the prevention part so you don't have to ha go through those horrible things that parents who have ch children that have been trafficked have to go through you go weeks months not knowing where your child is if I can jump in there, I mean, I was just this last week sitting next to a couple from Orange County whose daughter was trafficked. Hmm. And and it was a case where she she met somebody online, went to go meet him. He shot her full of heroin and started selling her. And it wasn't until he and his friends were going to sell her to a gang that she ended up escaping. But by then she was addicted to drugs so heavily that she went back out. And I think that I I, I, don't, I just wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy sure. um, th yes. to go through that kind of pain of having your child be trafficked. Right. Well, I think that the, you know, from that educational standpoint, and I know we're going to talk about the festival in a second, and I saw that you have panelists and you have speakers that are yes. telling their stories. And, and really, it's it's through those horrors and hopefully that education that people become more and more aware. And, and hopefully through this show and other things that you're doing and yes. certainly the festival. Mm -hmm. Because I, cause if you're not exposed to it or and you're not watching it on television. I mean, it's certainly not a movie I'd go pick out on TV to watch, right? So, no. so there is such a, a a ground roots education that really has to happen from school and, and from parents. And to your point, those that are most susceptible that may not think of it versus the parent in Newport Beach that you know has all the money, has all the the wealth, and all the the privileges it can happen to their kids too. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah, and increasingly does. I mean, they're the ones with the smartphones, more and, and, more. and they're the ones that have easy access to the internet, which makes them vulnerable and, and preyed upon. Okay, the the festival so is coming up in April, and right. what's the dates of that? The third and the fourth. Third and so the fourth. So it'll be Friday and Saturday. Okay, now last year was your pilot. I'll call it a pilot one. Yeah. So here we come round two. So in building, so we're going to go marketing now, some branding stuff. So in building. The awareness and the and and the the traffic, if you will, you know, towards your your event. What has been the most significant strategies you've used to build awareness and, and and drive engagement? Well, I think being being our first one, it was really just personally driven. It, it, we we didn't have a whole marketing plan and strategy. It was very strategy. grassroots. It was very grassroots, very grassroots. <laughs> and it was it was each person talking to their friends. So I've been working for eight years, and, I, and I'm and i connected to a lot of the organizations that work all through Southern California and even international organizations. So I drew upon those relationships to to expand the awareness of the event, to show them that this is something that, that we can all be a part of. So it's, it's, it's meant to be kind of a really inclusive event and in that any organization that's doing anything to help stop human trafficking can be a part of this. Because what we found, and, and this was the intention, the intention is show them a film. And, you know, it's like when people watch the movie Taken, you get all riled up and you want to go shoot pimps. And that's the kind of the, the very visceral, <laughs> natural response to watching a film like that. But there, there needs to be context and there needs to be kind of an understanding of how we can actually end this. And right. shooting pimps is not the answer. It kind of has a certain satisfaction, but there's, <laughs> it's, it's not the answer. 
so so through the arts, if we can touch people's hearts, open people's hearts through film, through music, through dance, um, through a variety of art mediums, then then we can start to give some education for how you can be involved. Mm -hmm. How can a housewife? How can how can the the soccer mom? How can you know a youth pastor get involved in ending human trafficking? So what we wanted was to have all the organizations, the the tremendous resources here in Southern California. I mean, a lot of the rest of the country is starved for, you know, the the kind of resources that we have aplenty in in Southern California. So how can they connect? If someone wants to help support a shelter, you know, where where a child who's rescued has a place to go that's safe, um, foster care. One of the components this year will be really centered around foster care because there's just been a pipeline. You have children that are so broken, they're so abandoned, they feel worthless already, and then they just get kind of shuffled into human trafficking, which mm. is just deplorable. Through the foster system. Yes. Through the foster system. It's almost like a yeah, feeder. Yeah. The, I mean, you know, I think about from a, a branding standpoint, positioning standpoint, I mean, I always look at, you know, a rational appeal and connection with my customer or the audience right. and an emotional one. Okay, so there's that rational side, right? And some of the, the facts and the statistics we can all show. But it's that emotional connection yes. when people see it or see exactly the film right. or, or hear or speak with somebody. I mean, that's that's so visceral. I mean, that that right. is incredibly powerful if yeah. you guys can, you know, really communicate that and, and have the audience carry that forward. Because that, the rational facts and figures, those are all great. Um, and they're important, yeah. but it's just facts and figures. That's right. It's the emotion that you have to get, and then that has to spark action. And I think so that's where the panels come in. So we have experts in the field. We have survivors. Um, then you have the filmmakers. Why they even bothered to make the films? But then there's a, there's a whole interaction. And I think one of the most moving moments in the last festival was a woman stood up during the question and answer period with the, pa with the panel and said, I never even told my husband, but I was trafficked when I was a kid. Oh, wow. And so please take this seriously. I mean, she stood up in front of a the theater full of people and, and shared that, that this was something that, that was real. It happened to her. Um, and there were those kind of moments where people's hearts were opened. And, and then we want people to, to feel like, I, I have to do something. And so then that's the next step. Mm -hmm. So then go out and engage with, with an organization or with, with a means to be able to actually do something in your community. Right. I mean, if we look at a, a funnel, if you will, I'm going to do some marketing stuff. But I mean, Good. you're building awareness, you're driving interest, and then you're driving engagement. Yes. I mean, if it, it, how do you move the people through that pipeline so they become aware of the problem, become aware of the tools and the aspects, and how do you get them interested and through the film festival and things like that? Right. Then how do you engage them to actually do something as opposed to saying, hey, that was great, I'm gonna go home now and right. forget, you know, about it. forget about it. Yeah. The, um, now, I, I asked a couple questions of all my guests, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna backtrack just a little bit, but because I think it's relevant. When you think about the challenges of growing this festival, what keeps you up at night? I think for me, it's just that, that we're up against this idea that this is not happening here and that this is not something that's ever going to touch my life. And, and, and it's like as long as people see it as an over there problem or it's a someone else's problem, that to me is, is the messaging so that we have to get through to people, is that this is something that's, that's it's damaging our communities. It's like, when I, I mean, I started to think of this as a, as a crime against humanity. This is not just a, a simple, you know, crime against this particular child, but we're being robbed of doctors and, and people that we need in our communities. These are, these are children who are being taken away from us and are not being allowed to become the people that we need them to be mm -hmm. and, that, and that they should be allowed to become. And, and so for me, that, that's what keeps me awake at night is that, that we need to be able to get this message. How can we get the message through to people that, that there's hope? That we we can't actually end this. This is not like it's something that's that's impossible to, to fix or impossible to end. If we can deal with the, the the root causes, which is really my concern, how do we go upstream and look at how vulnerability is being created? How do we how do we go upstream and prevent a boy from feeling entitled to buy an eleven year old for sex? You know that boy is coming out of our homes, mm -hmm. and and how do we how do we kind of start working upstream to that point? So the thing that, that gets me, and I, you know, I'm the creative side of the, the festival, sure, um, and that's what that's what keeps me awake at night is that people are not getting the message that this is something that that is causing a deficit to us all. Okay. Sonia, how about you? What keeps you up at night? <laughs> well, the same things as Patrick, but uh, more. Uh, how do we make this happen? Uh, more like how do we make it happen in reality? You know, uh, bringing films, arts. 
uh, people to the festival to make it a success. And the ultimate thing is, it's never a measure how many kids ooh, kids you might save, but um, just so that it doesn't happen. And it might take a generation, but we are actively wanting to really get the word out on awareness and prevention and how do we do that. Well, I, in any situation, building a brand takes time, and you're building a brand with your festival, and, and it's not something that happens overnight. But it's a lot of persistence and passion and dedication to, to make that work. Now, I have to ask, because we're talking film, does any of the film community from Hollywood embraced the, the festival at all? Um, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the organizations we're working closely with is, is they're a group called Artists for Change, and that's, and that's made up of filmmakers, um, everyone from producers to actors. Um, and then I, I have spoken several times to you know, groups of those filmmakers. Um, there's, there is a growing interest within Hollywood of making films that are going to affect social change of course and and this is one issue that that cuts across party lines it cuts across you know you know generations it's something that that young people can relate to as well as grandparents i mean this is this is an issue that we can really kind of grab hold of as something that's just atrocious i mean it, it, it's really really hard for anyone to come out in defense of having sex with 11 year old kids um and and the and the exploitation of someone who's in a very vulnerable place in their life it's just not something that people defend and so hollywood there are an increasing number of actors and actresses um jada pickett smith has has been active emma thompson um justin timberlake there's a lot of people who have taken this on as an issue that they're really deeply concerned about and that's growing and, I, and i'm hoping that as the as the film festival attracts more attention as a as a platform to reach people that are not going to go to a conference. They are not going to sign up and go to a three-day conference on human trafficking. Right. But they will come and see a movie or they'll come and hear a performer um, that then they can have their hearts opened and we can start to see change. And, and I think the, the, the end result of what we want is not to just weigh people down with the, the massive horror of this, but to re we want people to leave the festival feeling like they've been to a festival, that a festival that's, that's bringing in the, a celebration of the end of human trafficking. So it, it's not the intention is not to have this be this heavy, and, weighty thing. Right, and a lot of the movies, documentaries, there is there are stories of hope and freedom. They're not all dour and factual. That's just uh, it, it's it is enlightening in the end that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Well, I like what I like what you guys just said. Right, it's about communicating hope and change, not yes. just horrors. No, exactly. Right, and so it's going to the. the the end, the outcome that you're looking for, and working backwards, and how do you make that uh, make that change? That's exactly right. Now, with all these shows, and I say this every show, it goes by really fast, and my engineer is waving three fingers at me, which means we have about three minutes. So let's talk very specific now mm -hmm. about the festival, the dates. How can they get tickets? Do you need volunteers? Sure. I'm going to let you guys run with that one. All of the above. All of the above. Okay, we're over. <laughs> well, we have pre-sale tickets, uh, $25 for both days, and you can go to our website, seeitendit.com. Um, of course, we need volunteers. Uh, we are planning and we're hoping to have the street closed in front of the theatre, which will be fabulous. So we'll have a stage with musicians and dance, spoken word, and so many resource organizations will have their information out there so that we can have a call to action after these sessions. So the format of the festival is the movies themselves and then a panel discussion about the movie and those are the most imp impactful, most educational and really experienced people who have cutting edge information about human trafficking awareness that we all need to know. So our website is seeitendit.com. It has all the ways you can participate. Of course, donations, um, support for the actual festival itself. It's really going to be amazing. Okay, and a place to volunteer, I think I saw on the website. And a place website to volunteer, too. yes. And I think one thing is we, we really do want to increase the, the sponsorship of the event. And this is a way that I think a lot of companies, the companies who have already signed on as sponsors, feel like they're really doing something for their community. And, and it's a means then for them to send their employees, to have their employees learn about this. Um, so we, we can increase the education as companies take this on as something that they want to sponsor and support. They're, they're serving the community and also serving their own employees as they make their employees aware of this. So that's something we want. Another thing that, that was really important to me and I, it, is, is to have included in this, the F Festival on Human Trafficking, is also to have a free um, 
experience for children, for elementary school age kids. Um, Because I know everyone everyone kind of shies away and like, you know, how young do you start to talk about this stuff? But there there is really like age appropriate animation. There's age appropriate kind of ways to interact with kids. We have Officer McGruff comes, um, you know, and we have some police officers who are really good with kids. Uh, We work with Kids in the Spotlight, which is working primarily with foster children, Boys and Girls Club. So we have an event that's separate from the festival, but but down the street in it's another venue, just for, just elementary, for elementary school, school kids okay. to learn to be safe online. To start that's the education early, yes. right? Oh yes. Yeah. And I and I and I, I think you said the tickets were twenty five dollars for both days. For both, for both days. Yes. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, fantastic. Well, we are coming to a close. So one more time, tell people how they can reach you, and um, got some noise there going on. Um, how they could reach you, your website and stuff like that. Uh, so the website is seeitendit.com, um, and it's just as it sounds, S-E-E-I-T-E-N-D-I-T at uh, uh, .com, and then Patrick at seeitendit.com is my email address. You can email me there. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you very any, much, any different Any different contacts for you? Uh, no, it's the same. The same. All right. Well, again, thank you guys so much for joining me at the cafe. This is a, a really heartwarming and challenging and, and gut-wrenching topic. And, and I encourage everybody, if you're within listening distance or hear this podcast, to you, if, you're, if you can drive, attend this festival. It's going to be fantastic. Yes. And thank you out there for joining me at the cafe today. You can read more about me, read my blogs, and view my show videos at theponzigroup.com. Join me next week for lunch at the Business Growth Cafe. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com.